with the hip hop video, you got a lot of backlash with that. I was one of your critics in that. My apology to Easy Bi <laughs> was a masterpiece. It scared me at times seeing some of the marketing that you were doing. Are you serious? Is, is... <laughs> You're watching the Misfit Founders podcast, a raw conversation about the challenges of building businesses, overcoming hardships, and also feeling out of place. I'm Biro, an exited founder, investor, and advisor who failed quite a few businesses in the past. My mission with Misfit Founders, to help at least one founder every single month by unveiling the authentic stories of other founders and providing guidance and support. So I hope you enjoy the podcast today and get useful insights out of it. And if you do, do join the conversation on our WhatsApp community where we discuss topics like this one in this podcast, in group, as well as uh, private sessions. Link in the video description. Also, please subscribe to this YouTube channel so that you get notified when we publish new videos. First of all, I thank you so much for, for actually reaching out to do this. Mm, thanks um, for having me, man. I was actually surprised. Um, but then I realized that's actually the perfect show for you, to be honest. It, feel, <laughs> it feels like it. That's what I thought. I'm such a nerd. This is what I was doing 2 a.m. on a Saturday with my second bottle of wine. <laughs> I saw it come up in the suggestions and uh, watched the episode with you and Chris and immediately was like, this is a great format and I want to be involved. So. Do you want to give, give me a bit of a, I mean, I know everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I still have some surprises up my sleeve. <laughs> yeah. So maybe a quick intro of who Chris is and a bit about your history. How did you get into the business that you just sold and what your business does, used to do and does now Still does in, under Tempo? Yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so my name is Chris Cook. I'm uh, the CEO of Old Street Solutions. We make custom charts for Jira, which makes Jira reporting better, prettier and easier to use. Uh, we recently were acquired by Tempo, so I'm just adjusting to that. New world order, still feel like a, an entrepreneur within that family, but uh, yeah, definitely have a bigger structure looking after me. As for who I am and my background, uh, it is weird. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, this was my first job in yes. tech. <laughs> it, you know, I've, I've actually seen the interview with you and Alex. Mm, Alex Ortiz. Yeah, he, talking he about the fact that you had something in Thailand. Yeah, a scuba diving school and then mm -hmm. turtle conservation. We're doing ecotourism. So. Forgive me for asking this, but Chris, how old are you? I don't, <laughs> no. think, I don't think I've ever, I've ever asked you this. I've lived a few lifetimes, so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm 38. 38? Yeah. Not that far off. I'm no. 36. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I started my first business when I was 19. So yeah, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. You know, that's that's one of the things because I like from the first time that we met and all of the discussions that we had before, I think we have a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences. Um, like I started my business when I was 17 as well, and then mm. I've been on, on a, a serial entrepreneur for a long time. Never made anything stick. That's a different story of yeah, yeah. Jigsaw. But... I'm sure we have plenty of failures to discuss if oh, you want. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, and so... When, when you mention what is it that you do, what is it that All Street Solution does, you're very snappy at it. How, for, how many times have you had to, to introduce yourself like that and, and perfected? Because I had an episode not long ago talking about, you know, what was our, our goal, our mission, and just ingraining that in the, in the team ethos and culture and yes we make work management easy fun and accessible to everyone and when you said all three solution and what is it that you do it felt so natural so i'm i'm curious about that was that something that you set up in the early days or was it something that gradually became this is what we do it, it all changes street. all the time so that what i just said isn't a rehearsed line i've come up with before that it's just off the top of the dome but that's easy when you're just always honest and yourself and like mm. uh, transparent. So, but the, the truthfully, like even a year ago, I would say we have an accelerator growing multiple apps in the Atlassian ecosystem focused on non-technical users. Like, 
yeah, it, it, it changes month by month. <laughs> my, my job title changes, you know, like when I, uh, again, I, if I wrote down what my CV was two years ago, and every six months it completely changes depending on the priority or the stress. This is small business entrepreneur 101, right? I think you've also had it because I remember our first interaction, our meet up at BrewDog and, and, yeah, and so chatting with we you. We met at that <laughs> crucial time where we were both just starting right yeah. we still had day jobs even and we'd sort of started on our side you're, hustles, you're still at uh, adaptivist, adaptivist yeah. yeah and yeah. i remember the one thing that um really impressed me was the the ease of um of discussions like the the, the lexicon the vocabulary that you use and how easy it was for you to talk about our ecosystem and you know what is it that you do and how you help teams um, I remember we were even talking about, you know, the fact that at, at that point you were doing the um, the whole, well, we can migrate apps from server to cloud. You're doing that whole service. Yeah. And yeah, I felt quite impressed with how you talked about the ecosystem at that point when we met. And I think, like you said, I, I think it may be an organic thing and not necessarily something that you train or is it because you you've been you said you've been an entrepreneur since you were 19 sure. have you ever had this this ease of of discussing and selling always been comfortable talking about business so like, i remember when i was like 14 talking business with my dad and he was you know country manager in brazil and we were going around and i was saying oh dad your competitors have lots of billboards up and he's like oh that's good to know Chris that's good intel we can go back and we'll we'll have a see why they're targeting this area and whether there's an opportunity here when I was in my last year of school uh, you have a lot of free time a lot of private study time and I started going to business studies class just because I was bored um, and and I took the mock exam and, and got a B despite having never studied business so so I've always found it quite natural and fun and charming and then for in regards to our chat um, I've never wasted too much time trying to learn about Jira. So I think I have lots of space in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me, too. <laughs> Me too. I feel that. Uh, know nothing about Confluence and very little about Jira. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's good too, yeah. Because um, everyone else is. There's plenty of like nerds who love Atlassian and Jira and they're super fanboys for it. And, yeah. and I never really did. I, I just saw it as a business opportunity. Um, and I saw as good as they were at Jira, I, I was going to be a bad Jira admin if I start trading down that path. So I focused on learning about the marketing and the sales side of things. And, and again, you meet devs who they don't want to do any of that. And so if I can yeah. take that off their hands. But yeah, I was trying to sell any services I could, whatever opportunity found out. We did a bit of marketing consultancy for people. That was hard because most of the established vendors in this space don't have a lot of respect for marketing. And um, so it was, that's, that's true. It was I, very I hard to sell their yeah. marketing services. And I got told repeatedly, oh, marketing and sales don't work in the Alaskan ecosystem. And I saw how they did marketing and I realized why it wasn't working for them. <laughs> but, but as we both discovered, it, 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 it works well. I think we both had conversations with, um, with vendors because once we started getting noticed in the ecosystem with branding, with content, with the stuff that we were doing, people started knocking at our door kind of confusing what we were doing with brilliant marketing, right? Yeah. Like, it's like, like you guys do marketing really, really well. What is it that you do? And when I started talking about what we do, which is less about ROI, KPIs and stuff, and it's all about positioning, it's all about content, and it's all about brand awareness and stuff, it started shrugging and being like, ah, I don't think that's, that's for us. This is what I really wanted to talk about with you because I think me and you always get mentioned in the Atlassian space when people think yeah. of examples of good marketing in the Atlassian space. Whereas I think if we're both being honest and critical of ourselves and each other, half of what we do, I wouldn't consider good marketing. <laughs> and, that, and that's honest. It, it is, yeah. Pe people always talk about like the hip hop video, mm. right? And people say to me, oh, why well, you guys are crazy. And I'm like, yeah, but that wasn't good marketing. We did that because it's fun. I think they misunderstand yeah. where I think we both start is let's wake up in the morning and what's fun, what gets us excited, right? And for our teams as well, just empowering oh, yeah. them to come up with a new idea and try something. And I start there first and sometimes good marketing comes from it. But I think if yeah. you wake up and go, how do I sell? How do I make a marketing? 
you're the same as everyone else and every other cheesy, trashy post we've seen on LinkedIn. So I think people misunderstand that really, if I think both of us, right? I, I'll let you speak for yourself in a sec. <laughs> but if, if we start with fun and creativity, good marketing will follow. Yes, uh, and, and I agree with you. I remember because both Nikki and I come from a, I'm, I come from a tech background mm, and Nikki mm. comes from a product background. Nothing to do with marketing. And back in 2020, when we got our seed investment from, from Resolution, we had zero, we didn't even have a blog, right? All of our sales were from, from forums, comments, this, that, like hacking growth, right? Yeah. And then we got into marketing. And, and I remember we've done the Dan Martell. If you ever heard of Dan Martell, it might sound familiar. Yeah. He, he, he has um, a brand called SaaS Academy, and, and he also has a course called um, the Growth Accelerator. And we've done the Growth Accelerator course, which takes you, um, it's, it, ha it has like 10 uh, classes of two hours long videos with him explaining everything from webinars to paid advertising to this. And I remember how we tried everything in the early days, and we were like, we don't like this. This is too hard for us. Right. Oh, we like this. Oh, we like branding. Oh, we like creating content. This is fun. This is lighthearted for us. Yeah. And although we've done a couple of webinars in the early days, we slowly moved away from doing all of the stuff that we didn't like or mm. felt comfortable and just do the stuff that we that were, was fun for us. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that because people forget the amount of initiatives that we started and bend. Like we had a lot of things, even content wise that we pushed out and it didn't work. And we went back to the drawing board. And I think every single marketer will hate my guts. Our head of marketing, I don't know. I think secretly she hates me, <laughs> mainly, <laughs> mainly because I would just go head first. Oh, this is cool. I've, I've seen these influencers doing this and that and it's working. Let me give it a try. And, you know, if you go from a traditional marketing background, that's not the way you go about mm -hmm. marketing. You look, you, you do market research, you um, put together a plan, you put together KPIs and goals that you want to achieve, yeah. you measure things, you A-B test. None, and of which just either, go... <laughs> none of which either of us do, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, I think I hope that uh, a lot of people in the ecosystem see this and realize that what we're saying is that we're not good at mar we're not marketing mm. gurus. Mm. We're not good at it. We're, 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 we're bad at a lot of things. And I'm sure that there are examples in the ecosystem of people that do marketing really well. Um, oh, absolutely. And, and you know, that clever A-B testing and, you know, mm -hmm. proper marketing is understanding your audience and yeah. the metrics, like yeah. elements, I think. And I know Easy Agile, we talked to the marketing teams behind those apps. And I know they, they are a proper marketing team <laughs> that do marketing well. But for us, I think it's more just... I know as an entrepreneur, if I find something I'm passionate about and I wake up excited to do, I can't fail. Like I, I will yep. fail. I will fail multiple times, but ultimately I will work out how to do something with, which converts and which is successful. And I think it's stubbornness as well. Mm -hmm. Cause like you can have, you can have the, the best marketing team or head of marketing telling you, you should be doing things like this. I feel like uh, as entrepreneurs, we're, we're explorers in a sense and we want to try stuff and we want to do things as well. And that can be a double-edged sword in a sense, right? So you can it, it can pan out in some cases, which it do, done for us. Like, I don't know if I ever t told you how we actually started Monday Coffee. Did I ever tell you? No. <laughs> the reason why we started Monday Coffee, not because we were such a, well, we found a market gap and we've done research and realized there's a gap here. And I bought a piece of streaming software that I was using it for my own personal hobby. And I was like, well, I need to justify spending money on this. So what can we stream? <laughs> Just to justify the expense. Exactly. Your, your accountant said, why is this on your on your company credit card? And you're like, oh, quick, do some work. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I was like, what, what can we stream? Let's use this tool. If we're going to use, I, I want to put it as a, sp as a spending on the company, mm. right? Mm. I don't want to pay it from, from myself. Sure. <laughs> so what can we stream? And we went with Peanut for a walk, park walk, and we started brainstorming while walking the dog. I was like, oh, how about we do a, a wrap up of what whatever happens in the ecosystem? Because I feel like that you know I've always I could always keep getting lost. I read the 
the clarity slack i go on this and that and it's a bit um all over the place what if we do a roundup oh that's a great idea let's let's start and in the early days was i mean we are at the 125th episode more than two years later and you know we're getting decent traction with views and, and on a weekly basis um and that has but but that had helped us in so many other ways mm, from mm. an exposure perspective and and people seeing jigsaw as as a thought leader and and a brand out there and getting and the partnerships and connections partnerships and pm72 came from me bombarding everyone's timeline with monday coffee and other uh, content all the time because everyone was like yes definitely jigsaw guys um but again it just came up from from a stupid in a in a very stupid way which was can i make this can I use this tool? And even mm. this studio, like I'm doing this because I need to justify playing with technology and buying a ton of cameras and stuff. Yeah. No, I am, I'm also great. passionate about the, the, this, the, you know, just talking to, to, to founders and finding, because I think, and that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about and find out more is your journey. Because I don't think we're the cookie cutter Mm. founders i mean i think every single founder thinks that they're unique the, special uh, unique snowflake, yeah. snowflake <laughs> and so on um but i don't know about you but i feel uncomfortable in many circumstances when it comes to to business to the ecosystem oh, to sure. running a business to everything and I, I don't have imposter syndrome. I am an imposter. I, I am frequently like surrounded. <laughs> You're a fraud. By, yeah, I am. No, straight up. <laughs> Me like, too. Yeah. I don't have any training in marketing, right? Like when I first came back to England eight years ago uh, from Thailand, I'd had experience as an entrepreneur. I'd had uh, companies that employed 12 people. Mm. Some were successful, some weren't. You know, most all but crashed and burnt and ended up in my ex-girlfriend's possession. Um, and, and I came back to England and they looked at my CV and went, cool, we have a cold calling job on minimum wage for you. That, that was what they saw. The only reason I'm here is because Clear Vision took a risk on me. And was that your first job coming back in from... Well, no, Thailand? my first job was a cold calling job. Cold <laughs> it was calling. horrible. Just, yeah, spamming people on the phones, trying to sell But them. I feel that that, that hardens you a yes. bit in, in conversations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my first, first job ever was uh, high street sales. And, and then you just get used to rejection. And, and I don't think it's just taught me... Uh, to be a hardcore salesperson because I, I'm not these days. You know, I have great salespeople that do that for me. Um, but just rejection and failure. I, I think that's my main advice to any entrepreneur is just how often you fail is really going to determine whether you succeed or not. And, you, and, and, and people that are scared of failure and desperately hope this time works, that's the wrong mindset, right? You should embrace failure. And you should yeah. be constantly getting knocked down and have the enthusiasm to get up again. And, oh, okay. <laughs> what did I learn from that? Because if you learn from a failure, it's not a, it's not a failure. And I think that's probably your, because you mentioned you failed um, a couple of businesses in the past. I think that's, that's what hardened you. Mm. Um, that's definitely the case for me. Jexo is the first business that I can say that it was successful. Although, and we're going to touch on this, I think even Jigsaw, there are so many things that are, that I, when when we got acquired, that I was thinking, I'm not done. Like, I feel that mm -hmm. there's so many um, unopened boxes and unfinished chapters in, in my career as a founder and, and owning a business. And like, there are so many things that we didn't do right or never sure. done or there's still mystery boxes in a sense. A lot of the marketing stuff, a lot of the sales stuff, there's so many things that I've not really experienced to say, yeah, my next business, sales, I know it. Marketing, I know it. This. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I do think there's a lot of things that are still... It's tough. So there's two things. One, you said, as you said, you're looking back in hindsight, knowing now what you know, what you would have done different. But again, you know, you made the choices you could with the experience you had at the yeah. time. And, and that experience... It's hard earned and it's the reason why someone once said to me, if you don't look back at decisions you made in the past and cringe, then you haven't grown as a person, right? Yeah. It wouldn't be terrible if you peaked in high school and were like, oh, that was, that was me at my best. <laughs> and now I'm not doing so well. So it's good, it's healthy to look back and be like, oh, I wish I'd have done that. Yeah, there, there's a few things. As for unopened boxes, well, we're, we're, we're not too old. <laughs> but yeah, there's still true. some more opportunities ahead of us. But that, I, I want to uh, rewind on something. But mm. uh, the one thing, just to c conclude on this, I fucking hate when I see 
these gu- entrepreneur gurus mm. talking about and i was just watching one guy the other day i popped up in on my on my feed saying yeah i've learned, i know, I've, i've made a successful multi-million hundreds of millions business sold it you can put me wherever in whatever circumstances give me zero dollars and i'll oh, make it happen because yeah. i know the blueprint now i know the blueprint sure. i'm like, like what the hell blueprint blueprint are you talking about and how do you, it always I'm ends up being like a that. landlord in my experience yeah <laughs> which is a, probably yeah. a stupid man's entrepreneur yeah, yeah <laughs> selling property and stuff i'm, I'm not bashing on that it's, it's, i am it's an art like <laughs> people that that do it um do it well um you know get the reap the rewards but i do feel like that's the entry level into entrepreneurship in in a sense yes because um, you're not making something and this is yeah. what i was excited about like and this is why i feel such an imposter is that you know I, i'm not like you i'm not a dev right like the last time i had a product was when i was selling scuba diving courses since then i've been lost and just looking for opportunities and co-founders often to sort of who have an idea and make something i i knew that the Alassian space was desperately over catering for more and more technical users, but there was an expanding user base of people like me who weren't technical, yeah. barely knew how to use the tools and didn't want to have to go on a four day training course to use it. So, so I knew there was an opportunity there, but without the dev background or even a moderate amount of jury knowledge, I knew I needed a, a technical co-founder to, so, to lead but, me there. But what got you into it then? Because you know, a lot of mar- people that are into marketing sales, and have no technical background, um, kind of shy away or have this um, this thought that they should stick to the services that they know because, mm-hmm. because they don't have the knowledge. What gave you that, I would say, that what, what was the inspiration for you to get yeah. as into the marketplace so and build products? Part of it's being a nerd. So I've always been comfortable being out of my comfort zone. So at university, right, I used to love sitting around with the people studying physics and getting high with them. And they would tell me like, oh, about this is advanced physics and black yeah. holes and wormholes and time travel and paradoxes. And I'd understand like 10% of it, but, <laughs> but I just loved being like overwhelmed and out of my depth. Um, and so soon, you know, a lot of the entrepreneur advice I was reading was coming from the tech world because tech was eating the world. So, so I knew I wanted to be in tech um, and I didn't let, you know, a little knowledge get in my way. Uh, and especially when I found the Atlassian space and I was surrounded by people who didn't respect marketing, weren't good at marketing, but were doing very well despite it, um, I saw a huge opportunity because these people were doing well despite not having mm. one of the three yeah. pillars of business. And they were like, oh, it doesn't work in this space. I'm like, no, 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 you're succeeding in spite of that. Yeah. And, and if I can find someone who can do the technical and I bring my marketing and sales hunger to that, we will do well. And I think you were also, it, it significantly accelerated because if you look at all of the partners in the marketplace that are that were successful when you and I, because we kind of started in the same time, when mm-hmm. you and I entered the, the market, a, a lot of the successful ones were there for many years. Yeah. And- That had an eight year, 10 year head start on us. Yeah, b- build relationships, we're selling through relationships, basically. That's the whole premise of the of the ecosystem. You're selling through relationships. It, it's the amazing thing when you first go to an event like Teams, or used to be Summit, and you just see, you realize everyone knows everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's such an old boys club. Mm. <laughs> but I feel that, and you know, probably this is what you're talking about, you've seen an opportunity um, to introduce some of the marketing um, tactics and accelerate your growth because you did when, when did you start in 2018 or was it 2017? uh 2019 really i think we registered the business new year's eve on 2018 just so our company would look mm. older on paper <laughs> and we'd okay. started talking but we didn't have an idea what we wanted to build yet so i every when i was at clear vision i was walking around and saying oh, i want to start up a company i'm a serial entrepreneur who's with me and they just thought i was this weirdo <laughs> on minimum wage sending spam emails and being like, yeah, let's start our own thing. Um, but I found someone and that was Yasek where I met him and he was up for it and, and, and willing to take the risk. Uh, and then when I went to Adaptivist, found Tom. So then I had, you know, these young entrepreneurs. And I think Tom was great because at my age, at 32, maybe, um, 
life had kicked me. I'd had a few failures, but Tom was young enough that he hadn't had anything kicked out of him yet. So he had the naivety <laughs> to, to be, you know, more enthusiastic and more gun ho than I was even. And then, yeah. so that was a powerful combination. Same, likewise with Yasnik, just hungry for, for, for the glory, for the wealth. Um, and, and so their enthusiasm teaming up with them made up for me. It was a little bit wary, still wanted to do it, but didn't have quite the hunger and eagerness to jump off the cliff and try and build a plane on the way down. That, that these what was it catchy for you? Like, you feel like in the first few years, their enthusiast actually caught, caught on to you and, and, and you a bit more like, yay, let's go, mofos. <laughs> or yeah, or yes were you still no. so, the old uh, kind of like a reluctant, more toned down co-founder? So, so it was great. And and it moved things a lot quicker than I would have been comfortable. You know, mm. I probably wouldn't have taken us into half a million pounds debt. Mm. <laughs> and I've been in charge of things like that. Um, but at the same point, there's no point in co-founders that agree with each other all the time. So yeah. as soon as I saw that those two were the gun ho, let's go for it team, I was like, cool. My job's to play the grumpy dad, the devil's dad. <laughs> so that's the role I often play. Like, yeah, I, f I feel that that's. That's the only way to to make it work because before Nikki, I failed absolutely every single co-founding venture that that I tried to start, and it was mainly because I realized later, once teaming up and ganging up with Nikki, that it was because it was I was teaming up with clones of mine mm. rather than. Oh my god, bro! We have so much in common. Yeah, we exactly. think alike. This is amazing. And 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 that <laughs> always back backfired. Yeah. Whereas having someone like Nikki, that I think Nikki is you in this situation, and and I was, um, you know, Yacek and um, um, what's your Tom Tom Tom? Yes, uh, I was a excited one and oh, eager and oh, let's do this. And she would calm me down and be the the ration rational thinking behind some of this stuff and and just test me on certain things because i would go and say we should we should do this campaign that would be killer and she would go right let's analyze this well if you do this that's going to happen i'm not sure about that you're going to invest a lot of our budget into that we also need to do this so she would kind of put a bit of a, of a break on cert yeah. certain it, things. It needs to be the right balance though, right? Mm. So it's great to have dissenting voices. Um, and I, I describe that creative friction, Yeah. right? Because there's nothing worse than two people in a room agreeing, then there's an extra person you don't need in the room, right? A yeah. waste of time. Um, at the same point, I really like the idea of a culture of yes. So um, I thought this was my idea. It turns out Amazon has it as well. Right. I guess they copied me. <laughs> so, <Sure. laughs> I, I remember, you know, working at companies where they would junior people would come up with an idea, and they're like, "Cool, if you write a business case and then do a presentation to the management team and convince them, mm. then maybe you get to do your bright idea." And I was like, "That's terrible," because the average person is busy and terrified of taking that chance. And me, as an entrepreneur with nothing to lose, I would happily do that, but I hated it every time. Um, and so what we have at Old Tree is a reverse business case. So if a management, if a manager wants to say no to someone's idea, they have to write the business case. They have to spend the right. time. Why that's a no. Why we're not doing it. Yeah, because you, why put the admin overhead on the person that's being creative and taking chances? It should be the other way around. So so I know what you mean, and it's good to have that balance, but it's important also you have a, a culture of yes. Yeah. Take chances. Very and true. I know you guys do. Don't yeah. <laughs> I've seen. But I think, yes, we do. But I think we've also threaded a bit more, um, I would say, a, a bit more careful with certain things, mainly because, you, you know, I had Nikki that was a bit more of a caution. Like, I, I sometimes can have the craziest ideas. And I'm honestly, today, I'm glad that some of those ideas didn't make it out the door. Right, and I'm getting to some of, some of the some of the controversial stuff that you've done as well as Old Street Solution. Me, what controversial? <laughs> I said as Old Street Solution. Okay, <laughs> I'm not blaming anything on you personally, although you, you probably know, should, yeah. yeah, you should. <laughs> um, but that is that had kept kept us. You, you know, we've also always been the type of um, nerds. Oh, this is cool. Let's try this. Let's let's talk about this topic and let's dive into it. I'm also coming from a background of pro like kind of project management. I've, I was um, 
I was leading uh, the technical team in the previous company and I had to learn how to structure, how to organize. And I think a lot of that has been like, for example, when we've done our first content calendar, we used, after doing the course, the growth accelerator, um, this course from Dan Martel, we put together a uh, content grid with all of the uh, hot buttons, the uh, the level of engagement of leads from from cold to warm, and we started mapping ideas for, to engage every single um, level of. And we've always kind of have this approach uh, aside from my let's just fucking do this. I have this yeah. brilliant idea. Let's just do it. So it's always been a balance of, or let's. You need let's, both, right? You need the yeah, wild exactly. ideation, and then you need the structure. I, yeah. I often notice if you if you just have wild ideation whiteboarding sessions mm. with marketing teams, you end up with um, a lot of top of the funnel stuff, right? So for those that don't know, we dressed up as a T-Rex and ran on stage at Teams in Vegas two years ago. I heard ago. about that. It wasn't everyone there. heard about it. That's the point, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then when everyone asked, like, why? No one had an answer. <laughs> right? like, like, would it result in sales? No. And often I said we were just making noise. Yeah. I described it like a dog chasing a car. But what's the dog going to do when it catches the car? It doesn't know. <laughs> it's yeah. just doing it for the sake of it. And too much without the the, the process and procedure and like proper organization that you described at the bottom of that funnel, it's very easy for even quite good creative marketing teams to be making noise, but it doesn't convert. It, it, it's pointless. Yeah. And, and we, I think we're, we're, the, we're the same in that sense. I think we focused a lot on making noise because yeah. branding, because mm. content distributed and- Because fun. Because fun, yes, <laughs> exactly. Could. It's, it, it's fun. and. Yes, we had structure stuff. Yes, we had, um, you know, paid advertising. Yes, we had uh, tracking pixels and all of this stuff put on, on our articles and we would retarget, remarket and so on. And this is, but, but this was, this was all happening when we hired our head of marketing, which yeah. was passionate about this, came coming from a um, paid media world yeah. and setting up all of this. I would still... That was when we were doing it, when Nikki and I were doing it on our own, we were very weak at it. Yeah. And we were weak because we didn't really enjoy it that much. Yeah. So same for me. Like I, when uh, Theodora being hired changed everything. And until then, it was just making a lot of noise. Mm. And, and this is my cautionary tale to people is that they, a lot of people see our noise. That's the point. It makes yeah. a lot of noise. And they think, oh, that, so that's good marketing because those guys are doing well. And I'd say no. <laughs> like we've had some hits <laughs> in that white noise yeah. <laughs> that's been created. And it's when you hire a marketing manager and things start properly converting. Um, that's the boring detail. I always, I hate this, you know, the 20% rule, Pareto principle that 20% is the most important. I say for every person that thinks they're the 20 percenter, there's a team behind them that have to pick up the 80%. Oh yeah. And they think they're the superstar whose output matters. No, all of it matters. Yeah, it <laughs> Just the guy that's being interviewed for the TED talk is a 20 percenter and ignores the rest and he has the luxury of it because he has a team of people behind him picking up the pieces it doesn't and i'm sure you know i've had so many moments of yeah it's because of me um but i probably also had our um because i keep keep on putting her on the spot here but probably our head of marketing had so many times that rolled her eyes thinking i don't know i'm assuming thinking oh, it's, a fucking CEO is out there again doing wild stuff and like the trendy stuff where what moves the needle is my work, yeah. my structured work here. And the reality is is none. Like it's, it's both because at the end of the day, without her ability to to structure um, uh, funnels and and get us uh, more foot traffic and get us leads and getting people interested in the product through through um, paid advertising and through these organic funnels and so on, then we wouldn't had some of the sales. But in the same time, without me, me, me on ca on 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 LinkedIn's profile on everyone's uh -huh. LinkedIn timeline all the time, we didn't get the notoriety that that we had, and we didn't we wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to do uh, PM seventy two, and we wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to sit down with um, acquirers and and get acquired. Yes. Well, and so I did on. always say that like, branding is very good for recruitment, 
and being acquired. Yes. Right? It doesn't necessarily convert, um, but, but it's very good for those two things. Um, I think the other thing with this noise making is it's not repeatable or scalable. So every week you have to think of a new idea. Yeah, that's exactly. the thing with the LinkedIn algorithm, yeah, yeah. right? You get a post, you get a bit of a boost, right? Very and then true. it drops. Whereas if you set up this remarketing and the proper funnel and conversion and getting people to subscribe, that then becomes not just treading water, but building a scalable base you can grow on incrementally. Yeah, so, so that's yeah I think um, the... Uh, the viral stuff and the shock factor you have to work hard to continue to do it because if you if you if you try to shock people through the same thing over mm -hmm. and over again it just becomes Diminishing noise in returns. the background and sure. yeah it, it yeah so and i think that's that's what we've seen with everything that we we were doing because we would do an event and it would be so much noise around it but if i would do the second edition of that event like you know, it's yeah. Uh, you, you, it's 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 getting on. You have to top yourself up in order to get more noise than mm -hmm. you got with the first, because um, it was a novel thing. I don't know if that makes sense. Of right? course. So, well, I, I, yeah, we haven't done another hip hop video, <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't done another uh, cartoon making fun of our competitors <laughs> for that very reason. So with with the with the hip hop video, I felt I feel like you got a lot of backlash with that. And I don't know if that's true, but I was one of your critics in that. And I remember me sending you a message about it. Did you, was, was is it valid? Did you get a, a lot of backlash or people were mo mainly like, oh, and this this is cool, well done? Um, interesting question, I like it. So the backlash was quiet. It wasn't as public as I hoped. I was right. hoping to provoke an argument in the comments. Right. <laughs> a few people PM'd me and went, mm. uh, I, I had to provoke my own drama. So I got Tom to pretend to be angry at the waste of money. And he was, I was on his LinkedIn right. in the comments being like, well, this is a dumb idea. This is a waste of money just to kind of stoke up some drama. Um, the first version of the hip hop we, we, video we saw was, uh, yeah, bad. <laughs> we hired some dancers. And as soon as I saw their CVs, I knew we'd have a problem because it was their, their skills were like twerking, pole dancing. I was like, are these dancers we've hired? <laughs> What's going on here? And I think it was just a classic case of just too many men or boys in the room uh, that got a bit excited. Um, finally, once we edited the video, it was better and I was a bit happier with it. But to this day, Morgan won't talk to me about the hip hop video. And, and I think as a recruitment tool, I'd be very surprised if it actually helped us recruit anyone. Mm. What it did though, um, in terms of, you know, branding, uh, there's not a partner that doesn't know about us at this yeah. point, right? Um, again, does that convert to sales? Probably not, but because we have all the other stuff, they're like, oh, I know those guys, they're the weird hip hop guys. Occasionally I meet someone who has no idea that we make apps <laughs> because it wasn't heavily featured in the music video, which is why I don't recommend it as a marketing technique. Yeah. What it was genuinely uh, was a team building exercise, right? I bet that was a really cool experience. Of all to the things we could have done. All of that. And you've got to remember this is middle of COVID lockdowns. Mm. I hadn't ever met half of the people I'd hired. So this was our first time together. And of all the things you could do, yeah. uh, go karting, paintballing. This yeah. felt like a really good team project to work on. Uh, you know, I, I can definitely see how, how how that was very creative and very bonding as a team because you're literally filming a music video. Yeah. And it's fun. You do it. You learn about these things. You, you, you get to clown around on, on camera, um, which, again, it's it's a really good experience. And, you know, in a sense, like, I would love to do a music video with my team. Mm. I think where the the world was divided was you had half of half of people at least that i talked to i don't know how many people talked to you directly you know i i, I kind of came directly to you and then said and i didn't want it to to, to go in the comments and yeah. and be because we know each other and i i, I would have this is the thing people are too polite in this ecosystem. i would have preferred it i was trying to kick up a storm in the comments <laughs> yes but the thing is that i i know you right yeah. uh, we have conversation and we have a relationship so for me to have gone and said and tell, told you, look, you know, that seemed like a bunch of dudes on, on camera. It seemed not very inclusive. Yeah. Um, that was coming from from both me and Nikki. Yeah, yeah. Like I've I've 
grew up with Nikki in the business world and, and started a business and so on. So that felt, and and I wanted to to tell you directly and not go in the chat because then if it signaled, well, you know, well, Biro's not my bud. Sure. He's going publicly to talk uh, about it. Sure. And things. most people would be offended if you, yes. you know, doused me in the comments. And, and I'm the strange guy. I wanted it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, but I think the, the, I think the the ecosystem was split on it at least from 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 what I've heard and the discussions because like you said people were like oh have you seen have you seen that have you seen? and and half of people and I think the half that were excited about this and they were like oh that's such a cool thing and then seeing the good part of it as in this is a good bonding exercise and you guys made such a such a high end video yeah. music video. What I've seen were people that didn't had that much um, in their leadership and so on, female yeah. co-founders or leaders or there is so, so they run by dudes, by it, run, by it. Yeah, run yeah. by developers, right? Yeah, and yeah. They're a bunch of dudes and in, in 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 a company. But I think companies that like mine, which were like a bit like, where's where's all the the female rappers, right? No, no, I, I think it's a great point. And I think as someone that uh, embraces failure and lessons, I, I took that uh, criticism immediately. I mean, look, I wasn't blind to it. The, as soon as I thought, saw the first edit of the video, I was like, yeah, we've got a problem there. <laughs> um, I, I think that's what happens when you just have a room full of guys, right? This is why you need diversity. <laughs> because, because if you just have a room full of guys, none of the guys in that room came up with that idea. Uh, even Berry, who is a feminist, who doesn't like hip hop as a genre, no one felt comfortable saying, hey guys, does anyone think this is a stupid idea? Um, and to be honest, at that stage of our company, we were a bro tech startup. <laughs> and that was the output. I, I think we've done enormously well since then. I think, you know, um, and again, not got rid of the uh, the beer fridge and everything, <laughs> the ping pong <laughs> tables, and <laughs> uh, we, we never had any of that nonsense. But um, no, I, I think, uh, and again, this isn't wasn't part of a diversity drive, uh, but just you know, we were a very small company, and our yeah. first hires were in our immediate circle and friends of friends recommendations, mm. and so, and and so naturally, and this happens with a lot of companies, you just end up with people like you, kind of a exactly. homogenous group, yeah. and then as we grew, thankfully. Um, not even intentionally, if I'm honest, because it wasn't like we were like, we must hire more women. Yeah. It, it just got better. Uh, and we, we hired some great women. Mm. Um, and now that sort of thing wouldn't fly and we would have their sent in voices. Morgan wouldn't let me get away with it. And good. <laughs> like, and good. Yeah, it, it is. And I completely agree with you. And I think I've seen this repeatedly. And, and it's not because I am the, I'm a dude, right? I'm a white dude. I know that I am part of the the problem in a sense. God, Brighton's changed you, bro. But <laughs> but here's the thing. I was super lucky. The reason why I was lucky was because in the previous company, when I was working in 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 London, I've spent five years polishing myself as a professional, and mainly because oh, I came in there, I knew nothing, mm. right? I would mansplain in a chair in a meeting, be like rib rubbing my belly, yeah. whatever, in a group of they in, in, in on a meeting with a diverse group. And I had to be told off, right? I had my manager a couple of times saying, Hey, you know, you know, there's certain things that behaviors and postures and words and things like that that you need to make sure that you're not you know, impacting and affecting others around you that might not have the same culture and the same background. Because I'm coming from from Eastern Europe, right? Yeah, not famous for its wokeness. <laughs> exactly. And and even though I have good intentions, I wasn't coached and sure. trained in certain... But you are given feedback. And what I find really interesting is many men in our position, when that happens, I hate it because I'm a nice guy. Mm. What are you saying about me? Yeah. No. And, and this is it. And this is the learning from failure mindset that people need to embrace with all kinds of things, right? Yeah. You got that feedback and it would have been very easy for you to get sensitive, defensive. Oh, this is the problem with feminists, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Ruining the offices, we can't be men anymore. But instead you listened and thought about it and dug a bit deeper and, and learn. And, and I think that's really important. It's very easy in these circles for it to be sort of college educated, mm. preaching to the choir, 
right? Yeah, yeah. They sit around the table and everyone agrees with each other. That, oh, we're all on the same yeah. page, right? And it's really important for people like us that are on the journey that aren't perfect examples of paragons of woke to have those conversations because there's a lot more people like, it's, guys, it's okay. I got some criticism. Some of it was a bit heavy handed. Some of it was spot on. Yeah. <laughs> like I made my mind up. I didn't immediately get defensive and reactive and go, no, Biro, you're wrong. I know I'm not a sexist, so... Mm -hmm. leave me alone to make my twerking hip-hop videos <laughs> I, I think it's i thought about it and that's important like, putting no yourself in 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 the, like kind of like putting yourself and that's that was for me i don't know if it's for you as well the reason why i was understanding and immediately i was like holy shit i'm i'm at that i'm actually yeah that's a shitty thing to do or say mm -hmm. or be like was because i was instantly when I was being told I put myself in the shoes of the person that I was in a meeting with when I was doing a comment that was a bit off or that I had a stance that was like mansplaining or something like that and I would be like oh yeah like if I would see that I would be like what what do you call two men mansplaining to each other a podcast <laughs> 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 thank thank god I'm, I'm 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 not inviting only men because this would be yeah but uh, I, uh, you might have, uh, i've seen so many podcasts out there with bros um yeah. talking about yeah that's uh, anyways it's cringe um i, I want to shift gears a bit mm. because and this is one of the things that i'm like are we in a way the same person although we're quite different we started very in in the sim very similar times. Yeah, we had a similar approach to business, which is let's do the the shit that we love, and we we got to partner up with very the, the same people. Like we we both partner up with Resolution, mm -hmm. and we got acquired in very similar times. Yeah, so it feels like a bit uh, odd. Now I know that we have different in a sense we had we had different visions and goals for our businesses and and, and such I like, and I've been public about this Nikki and I always wanted to to sell to to be part of a bigger team we've we've always been we're gonna build it until it feels too stressful as a little guy and and at that point let's find the best home for our team and get and get acquired and, and I want to hear about your journey and and where you are with that and how did how how did your you know your your story with your buyer temple um yeah. got to be there's a lot to unpack there but i'll start with our differences because i think they're the most interesting yeah. um i did always announce i wouldn't sell um, you're very public about it like yeah two years ago i went around teams telling every vendor do not sell do not sell we need to form a pirates alliance against the evil empire <laughs> the people with money buying us all up and we need to be strong and independent um at the same point i did yeah you, know, you resonated with me when you said you knew at a certain point it would get too big uh, and too tiring and i always knew that so mm -hmm. i've seen coming up uh, various companies uh, that there were leaders who were sort of out of their depth, that they might have been the right person to take the company from zero to one or one to 10 or 10 to 100 employees or 100 to 200. Yeah. But those are all different job titles and different specs and different types of people and different interests. So for me, I've always been acutely aware that uh, there would be a time when, when my time w was up. Yeah. Um, and I always said as, as long as, as soon as I was getting in the way, of, of the success of my company, it would be time to leave. So my plan was to never ever sell. Um, the problem we really had was Tom, our technical co-founder, decided to leave. And he got really burnt out. And unfortunately, he did this a month before my firstborn son was uh, arrived. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't knew that actually. <laughs> yeah, so despite you know us building this together and, and saying we didn't have a plan to sell, um, he just did that classic young, hungry entrepreneur thing of grinding himself until there was no more. And that combined with being in, not only in lockdowns, but lockdowns in London. I escaped London as soon as lockdowns hit because I'm like, well, the city has lost all benefits. Tom. I'll be on a beach in Thailand. Yep. <laughs> right. Tom remained. Yeah. Um, and then went through two really bad breakups and, and work was his salvation. And so he started working even harder. And me with my experience... I'd done 
it's funny because I told Tom all the times I'd burnt out when we were first talking, co-founder dating, as a cautionary tale. Like, careful, Tom, because here was a time when I nearly died of heat exhaustion on a beach because mm. we were cleaning it, getting ready for the turtles. Here's a, I told him that as a cautionary tale. He took it as awesome. This is why I want to partner with you. You sound just like me. <laughs> like, no, 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 that was old me. Not <laughs> yeah, I'm saying you should the, do less the, of the that. The silly me, not the current me. And he was like, oh, that, that's what I need to be for this company then. And, and you know, I, I saw it coming. Um, and it's, for, you know, it's very hard once you've burnt out and lost the joy and just feel stressed to hell and despondent. You've put the weight of the world on your shoulders and then your back has cracked. Yeah. It's it, there's no coming back from it. And and for how long him. was he doing that? So when when after what was it two three years four years? When did he decide to? It's probably three years. I mean the the tough thing, we didn't all join the company at once mm. because you, why do you need a marketing manager before you have a product? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So yeah. so first Tom had to you know work on a product idea. Um, true story. Uh, we made custom charts as a test. We made color pie chart picker for Jira um, as a test. It was going to be just a proof of concept, learning experience. And then we accidentally made a multi-million dollar business out of it. <laughs> Whoops. Custom charts. Yeah, that, that's what it grew into. But it really was just what's the simplest, easiest app we can build to learn from. Yeah. And then people started buying it. And we were like, well, I guess we have to support it <laughs> then. I'm making money out of it. And, oh, and then a few more features down the road. And it's then like, oh, God damn it. Why are we making money out of it? <laughs> yeah, this was not meant to happen. Um, so yeah, yeah. Tom, just from the start, it was 100 miles an hour. It, he approached me to join his business, which was a services company. And I said, oh, no, I want product. And I have a dev team in Slovakia who I've known for years, who I trust, I respect, and we can partner with. And as soon as he heard that, he was like, I'm coming to Slovakia with you. <laughs> Booked a flight like later that evening. And, and and he went to Slovakia, I think, 40 times in, in a year. Like, like it was just constant. Like it got us where we were. I can't complain. Yeah. But it was just that classic. And and he'll say this, and I haven't spoken to him in a while. I hope I get the chance to. Maybe, maybe this interview's me reaching out to him. <laughs> but um There you go. Classic zero to, to one. He loved that. He described how he he used to feel like he was scoring goals. And now he feels like he's designing flyers to sell tickets to the stadium. Right. And he enjoyed scoring goals and he doesn't enjoy the admin of running a football stadium. That's that's where business that leads to eventually, right? And and you you mentioned this, right? So once you you can be a startup founder or you can be a CEO. Mm-hmm. Right. And and to be a CEO, you have to have that ability to uh to not just adapt as your business grows, but to let go and structure your organization in such a way that you become obsolete in a sense, right? And and you're the guiding star, but in the same time, you have bright people that take, take over your business in yeah. a sense. And for me, I don't, I don't think I enjoy that, at least at this stage. I don't think I would be able to have a 100, 200, 300 mm. business because it places me in in a position that I don't enjoy as a role. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're what talking, you're having meetings with middle managers yeah. who have meetings with their sub teams. And so you're just hearing everything from that. You're looking at spreadsheets and PowerPoints. Yeah. And you're talking strategy that hopefully gets enabled by a team you've trusted. I mean, it'd be interesting. Like, it, and this is why. I sold later than I should have, um, and and I'm going to stick around at tempo longer than I'm welcome because I'm learning. Because I'm learning. But right? is that something that you you want one day to to experience, which is a hundred, two hundred, five hundred people company where you're the CEO, the founder, and the CEO that evolved into that? I mature... don't know, but I wanted to take it as far as I could this time, so that next time, if the business blew up, I wouldn't be like, oh, I've never been here before. <laughs> right. starting at zero so, so i stuck on for a bit longer than maybe i should have um i don't know in hindsight i think i played tricky hands quite well while juggling a one-month-old baby 
So, so what, having what, Tom decide to leave was a ah, nightmare and, and we were really struggling sort of to fill that void. Um, and then Resolution came along just at the right time. Uh, we're brilliant partners and took us to a point where we could get acquired. And even though I said, no, I'll never sell, it was just obvious that then my choices were and, and Christian said this, as he often does, very plainly, very bluntly, <laughs> but entirely precisely. You have two choices, Chris. You can either scale this down and make it a lifestyle business, mm -hmm. right? So you just limit its growth and, and yeah, enjoy, <laughs> make it as little work as possible, the four hour work week sort of thing, right? You have a manager that handles that, manager that handles that. You don't go for aggressive growth. You kind of just like a dying star, right? <laughs> right? It just right. slowly gets colder and more boring. And, and what was the other one? Um, so <laughs> give it someone else. Okay, so right, so there's something missing here, right? Because normally in in a regular setup, you'd have okay, you wind down and make it a lifestyle business, mm -hmm. which is one extreme. You uh, sell it, which is another extreme. There's another option, which is you build it into a multi million billion dollar business which is still an extreme because at the end of the day when you reach that point it is extreme why was it that not in the discussion was it was that your but because option? i would i would like you i don't want to run a 300 person company i'm not right not the right person and you know unfortunately then selling's the most obvious thing because otherwise i, I would be cock blocking my own company and its own its mm. own success its own possibilities it just seemed sad. It seemed like the lifestyle version, but lying to yourself that no, it's not that. I won't be limiting it. I'll still be hanging around, but in a, a you know, uh, advisory capacity. Yeah, we've all worked at those companies. Yeah, <laughs> and it is a lifestyle business where the CEO or the, or the chief of the board is fooling himself and lying to himself, and is restricting the growth and the possibility. So, I think, you know, it, it's not something I'm an expert at talking about, but just for me personally. Uh, once Tom left, the the fuse was set, right? And and I think there's a cautionary tale there about um, not getting burnt out, like make, making time for the work-life balance, putting that in from the start, uh, listening to people when they tell you and give you that advice. But I think there's also a cautionary tale about co-founder dating. And I have this thing where, you know. Co-founder? Right, dating, choosing the right co-founder. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in hindsight, was Tom the wrong co-founder? I don't think so. Right, he was amazing, <laughs> right? He was what we needed from yeah. that zero to one scale. And what I've got good at, despite those dramas and emotional conflicts and differences, I'm good at handling that. I have the emotional intelligence to be like, okay, Tom, we'll get you out. I talked to five different options. Here's the one I think is best. They're gonna take over from you. Da, da, da. Now it's time to sell to Tempo. I, you know, I, I keep flitting at the moment between should I just become a sole co-founder and not partner again, despite all the dramas and the troubles? No, I, I, I think it, I will just keep trying this. And even if it doesn't always work, and sometimes with the relationships, they have their time and their place. Yeah. And that's okay. I completely agree. And I think I found it quite daunting because I've been through so many, I think I've had five or six businesses with co-founders and they all fail before Nikki. And every single time I would think to myself, should I start alone? Because people are like, I hate people. Because mm -hmm. you get, you get in, the, the disappoint, disappointed in a, a co-founder relationship. And, you know, it's, I mean, I, I'm not the, the snowflake and the perfect person, right? But from your own perspective, you're like, oh, that was disappointing. That was a disappointing relationship. Yeah, we're both at fault, but it was and, a And maybe for theirs too, but who cares? Yeah, I'm exactly. stuck with myself. Exactly. I can't yeah, change yeah. that relationship. You're, you're your own hero <laughs> yeah. in your storyline, right? Yeah, yeah. But every single time I was thinking about starting something alone, that was very daunting. Mm. It's like, that's bloody scary. Like, I can't really do that because who's going to help me with this? Who's going to be my my voice, um, my my bouncing board? Who's going to be my uh, voice of ration? Although I've rarely had voice of ration because this is one of the reasons why I failed every single startup with other co-founders was because no one, everyone was a sounding board, not a voice of ration, right? right? So you would talk and you'd hear the echo. And they, they, they tell you your ideas are great and you're like, oh, yeah. awesome, love it. Yeah, <laughs> or, or or they would come with an idea and, and you'd be the same, oh, that's awesome, let's try it because you're the exact same person, you're a clone of each other. Yeah. 
And but I still felt no, I can't do this alone. It feels daunting to me. And and I can uh, I really appreciate people that can go on a path on their own and make it happen. Where but that's I, most of the advice in the entrepreneur yeah. forums. They say, "Oh, partnerships are the most fraught and most likely to fail, most precarious form of business." But for some reason, I keep putting myself through it. I mean, partly it's because I don't have a choice. So I, I always used to call myself a non-technical co-founder, and I kind of hate that term because you know everything can be technical, right? Like marketing done well should be uh, very uh, technical. Exactly the analytics, and, yeah, of course, it's technical thing, but, right? Yeah, I'm not a product guy. Not mm. not since I'm no longer teaching scuba diving, <laughs> right? Like. I can't make a product. Um, and so for that reason alone, I, I need to find a technical or product person to team up. Have you ever considered getting into, is that something that you like or is it just because you don't find it appealing? Not technical, not to mm. say you're becoming an engineer, sure. but becoming a product person. Let's say you um, do some some studying around product ownership and you learn about what it takes to build products. and Kind of no, because how I believe product should be done well mm -hmm. is a lot of listening to customers and gathering oh, that yeah. data and patience and empathy and things that aren't my forte. <laughs> I think what I'd do much better with is finding a product person mm -hmm. that hates everything I excel at, hates everything I have a passion for, yeah. right? So someone, when I talk about marketing campaigns and how to send the best spam email and when to use cold calling and I see the, the look of like horror on their eyes, yeah. I'm like, cool, I, I will do that for you. I will handle that. Yeah, And that's why it's a, it's a good division of labor because yeah, you don't need me as a below average product manager and you don't need them as a blow average marketer the world especially the latin ecosystem has enough of that already um but yeah if i can team up with someone who what what lights their fire i mean it's it's funny when you talk to an accountant or someone and you're like you you enjoy this work <laughs> but it, yeah. it's bonkers to me but when i describe all my marketing and all the spam that, that they hate that and that would be their nightmare so yeah, there, there, there's all kinds of weirdos out there and you just kind of need to find someone who's the yin to your yang. But but it's good that you're confident about this approach and you know that you need help here and there. And one thing that I usually preach, and I don't know if you agree with this and I actually want your thought on it, is learn a little bit about the other things that you don't know about. Yes. At least if you don't have a co-founder that you really trust about it and say you're hiring someone on the product ownership side of things, right? Um, learn a tiny bit about what it takes to build a product. Engineering, uh, scoping, uh, I don't know, research-wise and so on. Learn about the other areas that you're not prolific in, at least a little bit, so that you can have those conversations with your team and you understand what they're talking about and you can you can collaborate and guide without being completely oblivious of, of, of around the the work that they do and i want to i want to get your thoughts on this well it's, it's a good point because i would say you know mine was a company split there was technical and non-technical tom had his domain mm -hmm. <laughs> right um and then that was replaced by morgan who it's now yeah the, hers and uh last year in berlin was kind of the first time me and morgan had a frank and proper chat about we should talk more <laughs> because right. tom had trained me not not to disturb right he was in his laboratory <laughs> no dads allowed <laughs> right. and, and i left him the hell alone and i thought that was fair because i've seen the the dev ceo who starts having an opinion on marketing and yeah. ruins everything right with their Very terrible true. ideas and their hot, it awful can go feedback in a very ugly direction if you're yeah. too opinionated about these topics. But I do think we went too much the other way. And, and, yeah. and honestly, like, I have had very little interaction with the product side of the company. Well, the dev side, the engineering side, none. The product side, more and more, because yeah. you need their influence to have good marketing. I right? need to be informed by, by the product team. But I do feel like as a CEO, you should be close to your team and people, especially when you're at a 10, 20 Right, yeah. and you're not that big. I, I went too far. But I mean, that was okay because we had co-founders. So yeah, Tom had people who he cared for a lot mm -hmm. and cared about and made sure they were happy and did everything for them. So they're being taken care of. Um, but yeah, as soon as Tom left, it became apparent that there was just this vacuum 
and and I just didn't know much about those people or mm. what they were up to. Um, and their trait, they're they're basically their uh, bread and butter because at the end of the day, yes, you can connect with people on a personal level, but I found it so difficult to build relationships with team members, either be it in a previous role or in my own company, team members that I have no idea what they're doing. Like, like I, I don't know their craft at all. And it's very hard for me to have a, a proper deep conversation and, and a, a relationship building conversation with someone when I don't know anything about uh, yeah. their industry. No, it's, it's the only reason I can't that, contribute. The only reason I'm a good sales or marketing director is because I've done those jobs. Mm -hmm. So when someone tells me what's possible and what's not possible, I'm like, oh, I have a bit of experience doing what you've done. And, um, but you're right. I'd, I'd, I'd say that's definitely like my next company. I'd like to build closer alignment on the condition that I'm clear. I'm here to learn. I'm not here to interfere. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be that hippo you talked about. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. But uh, having an opinion. And, and I think I'm really aware of that more than most. Um, I, I have to be very careful with my opinions and I'm very selective in how I deliver them now because it's very easy for a marketing team. Even though I'm always the fun-loving, chill guy, we embrace failure, everyone's opinion's valid here, it doesn't matter, feel free to correct me at any point. It's taken a long time to train my team there and, and a long time to train myself not to interrupt, not to come up with suggestions because quickly it just dominates. Um, and and especially, especially marketing people, salespeople too, very sensitive <laughs> to feedback and it has to be delivered very carefully. Very true. I feel like with and with our product engineering team, you go into a room, bam, 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 how, this, that, and everyone's like, yup, contributing. Here's how about we do this? How about this? With marketing, you have to have a lot of tact with right. how you approach conversation and direction. Yeah meetings and things like that it's I've, uh, I've trained my team hard to take me aside sometimes and say chris i didn't like how you said that and i thought you were <laughs> and i was like thanks for that feedback that's great that's necessary but yeah the devs devs who become co-founders get this wrong all the time like you, you need to talk to a marketing team especially in public in front of each other yeah how you would talk to a four-year-old that was on the verge of tears <laughs> like, but it's it i think it's it's both ways, right? Because so we had show and tell um, session every month where we put everyone in the same room and everyone should was supposed to talk about what they've been doing, show the stuff that they've been working on. And again, it's the same thing. You have to dumb it down, even if you're a marketing individual talking to the engineering or the product team, you have to dumb down the stuff type of stuff that you talk about in order for people not to fall asleep <laughs> in that show and tell session, right? They have to make it engaging for them. So in a sense, when we're doing those show and tells, the, the people that were sales salespeople, it, as in naturally, not necessarily in the sales mm. team, would get the room a lot more engaged because they, they knew how to talk about sure. the cool stuff that they are doing. So you, you were working for uh, Adaptivist and had your two years, three years of, of, the, of the business and then um, build that, you know, I'm Chris, founder of Old Street Solution Identity, and now you're working um, full time. How has that transition been for you? Different to how you'd expect. So when I was at Clear Vision, Adaptivist, I was always very much my own man. I was always an entrepreneur temporarily trapped in a company. So you're like an entrepreneur. <laughs> yes, in sense, yeah. Right? So yeah, like I would always be coming up with ideas and suggesting them. I found it was most frustrating at Adaptivist. No offense, great place, but my job there was a salesperson. Uh, my wonderful sales manager there uh, just told me one day, Chris, if you wanted people to listen to your ideas, you're in the wrong job. <laughs> All they want you to do here is sell. You're not here to think. Okay, <laughs> um, so that was tough. But at, Cle at Clear Vision, I very much, you know, came at it as an entrepreneur and never let my job description limit what I could do. I, I was there to do marketing, which resulted in sales. And that was a pretty broad remit. Um, and they gave me a long enough leash to try all kinds of weird and crazy things. So I it, it didn't feel it changed too much. And even now at Tempo, um, I'm still doing the same thing day to day. I'm looking after my team, making sure they have everything they need in the service management capacity, uh, and I'm making sure we crush it and, and sell lots. So it hasn't felt too different in terms of job function. Mm -hmm. Where it's really different is 
um, just what do I do with the next phase of my life? And, and that feeling of being a bit lost. And I think for many people, they imagine that selling, for you, it was a goal, it was a dream, it was a destination. Yeah. For, for me, I said I never would. I and mean, it wasn't just a negotiating position, although it's a good one. <laughs> but it, it really was, I will ride this ship as long as I feel I'm the best captain for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm in a bit of a middle point in life. I, I, I've let go of one branch and I don't know what my next branch is. Is it a I bit of a bit an I- identity crisis in yeah. a sense? Yeah, cause because I'm, I'm pretty I much there thing. as well. You know, although it, you know, because I don't think the goal has had a better or more lenient, uh, 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 you know, outcome to me not feeling a bit lost, right? Mm. I, I feel lost as well. And, and it's hard to complain because yeah. by most people's standards, we're successful. People are like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You got an exit. Rich white man tears, fuck yeah, us, right? Whatever. <laughs> so, but... It, it, it is difficult because I'm just between things and I don't know what. And I was, you know, expecting to feel some sort of, and everyone's coming up to me and congratulating me. And then you get the ping of the big money in your bank account. And, and, and I just, it didn't hit me. And I kind of know why, because to do this, when I had half a million debt in my bank account, had I looked at that and it moved me? I, I I would have quit then or jumped out of a right, window yeah. or something. And you just develop such a steady poker face and, mm-hmm. and steady hands that you just become immune to these big swings and these big feelings. Unfortunately, you have to. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to sleep and you wouldn't be able to survive. Very true. And so likewise, when, when the big money came in, I celebrated with my friends in Vegas, but it wasn't about the money. It was it was what we'd achieved together as a team. Mm-hmm. Like that That always felt more for me. And I'm an entrepreneur. I will be looking at my next thing. Um, a few months ago, I felt a bit lost and scared and, and that sense of loss, which was weird and counterintuitive. But having spoke to a few people like you in this space, that's natural. And what I need to do is give myself time. Yeah. Enjoy, you know, this hard earned success. Uh, and enjoy like the next phase, learn what I can working with tempo. Um, and yeah, I don't need to hurry into another thing <laughs> that's the thing and if you if you're a manic and um fomo type of person like i am i'm yeah, like i am super fomo uh, like it felt so uncomfortable to to just pause to just realize that i do have time um and you talk talked about it's never been about for for, uh, for me i've always had this moment in time pictured in my head this title of an exited founder Mm. like i wanted that title i wanted to see a a business from from its beginning to its outcome final goal right and i've dreamt of this happening for so long that when it happened it it did opposite to you it did feel to me like fuck yeah it happened. Yes, I've I've achieved that goal, and yeah. it was it was a re- it was a really big moment in for for me that I, like I wept like a baby at one point. Oh, it's like mainly because mainly because I failed so much in yeah. the past, and, and I've spent so many years just trying businesses and failing and misery and so on. So it was a big moment. That being said, these big moments are moments in time. They never define. Mm who you're going to be tomorrow or yes they do have a contribution but they're not a, a definition of who you are right and as as this moment passes right it will remain as a contrib- contributing factor to who i am but i am in that moment where i'm like okay now what yeah like, success is a destination yeah, it, a journey not a destination yeah right? exactly and and it's, that that happened but that, that that's not defining me. That was something that I really wanted. But I have so much more that I want to do in life. And, and I, I am in that identity crisis moment where I'm like, now what? Frankly, I hope it doesn't define you. Because in, in my experience, uh, success is a terrible teacher. And, and the reason like, we're doing well now is mm. because of all our failures and all we learned from oh, them. Yes. Uh, and I really do worry that we'll take the wrong lesson from the success and go, cool, cool. See? 
now I know I'm awesome. Mm. <laughs> because what's been my success today has been when I go into a room, not imposter syndrome, an imposter. <laughs> when someone comes up with an idea. A misfit, let's call it. Cool. <laughs> a misfit, perhaps. Uh, I will listen to them with yeah. an open mind and an open heart. And really, I hope they have smarter, smarter ideas than I can come up with, because otherwise we're in trouble. And what, what I'd hate to do is next time I go into the room, close my ears and be like, I know what I'm talking about. I'm a smart, successful exit yeah. co-founder, right? It's really important that we keep the same humility that got us here. Because, yeah, in the eyes of society, we've checked the box. Still the same people. Like, I haven't exactly. changed that much at all. Yeah, <laughs> but but that's that's why I'm doing this. That's why I called my podcast Midfit Misfit Founders and not like extremely successful and wealthy <laughs> individual <laughs> that will give you the secret formula of uh, how to become successful. No, because I still feel out of place. I still feel like I, I have not, I have so much more to, to learn and I feel like and we were talking earlier about I have some some regrets around Jigsaw which which is just things that I I wish I would have done that more I wish I would have done a, a, a lot more of this and so on I'm I'm I still feel like I'm not done this exit feels like a half baked thing mm. for me mm. because there's so many things that I haven't learned yet to do as an entrepreneur and as a founder. So speaking of regrets, how come we never collaborated? Because I always assumed we would and then it just never really happened. <laughs> there's there's so many variables around mm. that, but I think the probably one of the biggest for me and the reason why I've never reached out that much, I actually there's there's two things one was you were you're doing really well right you you've exploded since our conversations and so on um it one it didn't feel like we needed to kind of like um balance each other in order to support each other it was a crossover group. that didn't need to happen yeah right? if it, <laughs> it, it, it didn't feel like oh if we do this together we're going to at, at least in my naive mind mm. right oh we're building and and things are going our ways old street solution Cree seems to be growing and things are going their way it in my mind trying to figure out things it felt forced to try to to figure out ways for us to to um to do things together because we we're already growing successfully as as individuals. That's one. Well, I think I don't want to give you a cop out cop out answer. The other the the other reason was we we're very different, at mm -hmm. least in my mind, with how we approached like marketing and these kind of campaigns and initiatives. And I think even with the with the um, PM seventy two. We had a bit of a, you know, the the three of us, you, me, and then Chris had a bit of a well, um, this discussion. This is get three co-founders in a room and you're going yeah. to have an argument. We're um, all princes of our own small domains. And I think <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a hard-headed mm. person. Put you and I in a room. We can share a lot of great thoughts and ideas, but we can also have differences. Yeah. Uh, on on what it means and how to approach this and how to do that. Um, and I think I am very proud as well, in a sense. And I've I've been, um, it's been a bit different with my team and and yeah. and and the, the the people around me. I was gonna say, I bet we're very how we speak with our team, yeah, very gentle and listening. And yeah, yeah. is not how I would speak with another co-founder because, yeah. frankly, we're both busy, and I want to find the points where we disagree are the most interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is great for a brainstorming session, but actually executing and finishing yeah. a project, probably not. I, I think, it, it, to me, it felt it would have been hard work for us to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And and it seemed like we were in a world where we were both successful yeah. and that it did, just didn't, didn't materialize. I felt yeah. that it would have required uh, quite a bit of um, energy for us to work together. Um, especially with the you know back and forth that we had with PM72 and you know I had a different a different idea of what I wanted where I wanted to take it and how I wanted to structure it. um and you know you had as well your own values and your own beliefs that you wanted to be involved in a certain level and so on and and I think 
that was that was one of it. And and again, we were we had really different approaches to marketing. Um, I think we were the a bit more of the nerds that were putting together um, nerdy pieces. Um, I got a bit at times intimidated by some of the stuff that um, you're putting out as content. Interesting. Um, <laughs> like the um, uh, uh, guerrilla marketing or however mm. it's called with being a bit more rough with competitors sure. and so on. Aggressive. Aggressive, yeah. Making and, noise. <laughs> exactly. And again, I don't have anything against, like I know so many companies that do this, mm. um, and, but it's just, it's never been our style in sure. a sense. Like, well, and again, there's two things I think, you know, things like uh, Monday coffee, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That is very uh, open, supportive, yeah. community moderator so, yeah, sort of exactly. vibe, right? Whereas I've always been trying to bring a bit of, you know, wrestling exactly. <laughs> to marketing. A and we stay, we stay if away I have to be the that. bad guy, that's fine as long as it's getting attention. Yeah, we, we stayed away from it. And I, yeah. look, I, I have my own thoughts. Sometimes I might be a bit more, ah, oh, ranty about a topic that Atlassian, um, an update that Atlassian does. But sure. in a sense, we we did want it to stay away from that with Monday Coffee. And that has been a lot of our um, brand online mm -hmm. as well. Positive, uplifting uh, brand out there. We kind of stayed away from, from being... It's morning TV, right? It, it's Monday yeah. morning yeah, TV. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we stayed away from being too controversial. And, and why? Because... It scares us, like both Nikki mm. and I. Like we, we're not comfortable yeah. in in being too. Oh, it's upfront a it's a there. fine line. And again, mm. this is why I caution people not to try and copy other people. Like people see what I'm doing and go, "Oh, is, is that the key to success?" Then you just be an asshole on LinkedIn. And it's like, yeah. if you look what mm. I do, I'm very often pushing it, but I know where the line is. Um, I thought, like my apology to Easy BI <laughs> was a masterpiece. It was the best piece of marketing I've ever done. My apology letter. Uh, and it went more viral than <laughs> than the dinosaur cartoon did. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, not enough. Yeah, if you're going to play that game, you need to know what the line is and yeah. how to tread on it the right way. And so, yeah, I think that's my main advice. Is but again, for me, that's fun. I've mm -hmm. been playing on social media like that for years. I've been picking on my competitors for years. I know, and I've sometimes gone too far and yeah. learned from that mistake. And and so now I'm pretty good at dancing on that line. And I don't think someone should just try and emulate that behavior at all. It would probably go very wrong for them unless they were prepared to fail and learn from it and pick themselves up and try again, as I have for the last five years. Um, moving on, because this is a bit... Too I think, but but to, to summarize it, yeah. I think because you, you asked me the question, why I think it was a mix of, of, of all of these things from, you know, I would say if, let's say, you wouldn't have been as successful as you were and there would have been some opportunities midway through. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, All Street does this. Let's gang together and this. We can help each other. We can lift each other and so on. Yeah. And also, um, we didn't bump heads on, I think, one single time we bumped heads. Yeah, Every single discussion that we had on Zoom and so on, we, we kind of felt like it was a good vibe. Um, oh, and, and you were very important. Like, I don't think we would have gone with resolution had I not had the chance to have a chat with you and, and told me what it was. So that was a really, yeah. we've had really important chats that not often, but very important parts yeah. of our careers, right? Like, very like micro interactions in a sense, but but I think it was quite valuable for me as well in, in a lot of the marketing stuff that we've done. Um, but again, it's, it's been, we were doing great on our own. Mm. It felt to me um, a lot of work for us to collaborate just because we're very um, like big personalities, both you and I. And also it scared me at times seeing some of the marketing um, stuff that you were doing, mainly because Nikki and I weren't comfortable with, with a lot of the, you know, being more, um, raw online and so on. And this is why I'm doing this because I want to, I, I kind of want to start becoming a bit more open online mm. and publicly and so on. I'm, I want to push the boundaries of what it, what we share as founders online, because I did feel as we were doing a lot of cool stuff with our brand and with our co content, 
but you have to like I had to be a bit more refrain with what I put online because we had a certain language and brand that we uh, we were building. Yeah, and that's why I you know, I love the format of this show and I reached out because if if you want to have a frank discussion sharing some real secrets uh, an hour and a half youtube channel is perfect because almost no one's watching this lady in the show exactly <laughs> however um <laughs> this will be snippeted a oh, lot of no. this stuff so uh there will be stuff that will go on social media. is this when we do the bit where i pretend to be offended and storm off and yes run away? go ahead go ahead are, are you serious is, is... Fuck off. No, I'm done. <laughs> great well, that was that was a great great acting. Okay, I kind of I kind of start, started laughing a bit. So I'll I'll edit it. I'll shut my mouth in the edit. Um, so before we close off, I don't know if I mentioned there's three questions that I had at the end. There, there's mm. like the 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 ser- ending ceremony. But before that, um, is there anything that you want to talk about? So we talked about you know the collaboration stuff. Is there any other topics that you want to talk about, or anything else that you want to ask me? Well, just quickly, like how do you find mentors? Because there's obviously we don't have a lot of peers. There's not many mm. people who've been through what we've been through. Yeah. And, and I had mentors a couple of years ago who told me last year, Chris, you've got further than I've ever gone. So I don't know how to advise you at this point. So how do you find mentors like once you're getting to this level? Well, I'll give you an example. So one of my mentors is um, the, my boss from my previous company, um, from uh, Mudano who sold to Accenture and been helping me and advising me quite a lot along the journey of, of, of building, but also on the exit and all of that happening and so on and positioning. And, and I think that's one place to start. You have bosses. You've had like adoptive is clear vision and so on. People yeah. that have- they've, they've been great, very instructive along the way. Yeah. Clear vision sold, right? And, and, and he's, in the same position currently with, with an exited founder, that's kind of like the, the support peer and, and mentors. And, and I think people, often people think that mentors should be these individuals that are 20 years ahead of you and so on. No, mentors can be your support peers of like-minded people that are in the same path or journey or maybe one, two steps ahead. And those are the people that can become mentors. And usually mentors, uh, what I've learned along the way is are, you know, you have a, a mutual relationship and it's not this person is teaching me, but we're teaching each other. Mm. So, you know, you and I can be uh, mentors for one another. Your ex-boss, you can can sustain the relationship and, and make sure that you have um, gradual catch-ups. And what usually happens is you get to a point where it's like, we're having often conversations. So we just make it official once a month, booking yeah. in our calendar uh, and do that. And that's the first step. And then you also have like platforms and such, but that feels a bit unorganic to me um, when you start you know, looking for mentors on platforms that are specifically for mentorship. And yeah, I had a great one. It's called Baby Bathwater. And they did this holiday in Croatia. Um, they do it once every two years, I think. And that's like 200 or so people. Mm. I was, I felt very middle of the pack. I'll put it that way. Like I met this 27 year old who just sold his company for 470 million and was like, cool. You know, very, you know very well that we shouldn't compare ourselves to others, but just no, yourself. <laughs> but no, sure. But it is great to have people who have been there, done that, and you yeah. can talk through things. It would be, it would suck if I went there and just, yeah, we were a dick measuring contest. <laughs> that would have been a waste yeah. of a holiday. But thankfully, most people were there to share and, mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, really contribute and give each other advice. So that and, was wonderful. And then there's yeah things like this groups and, and communities and syndicates. Like for example, I'm, I'm part of a, um, a angel investor syndicate here in, in Brighton. Um, and we meet once a month, we have dinners and, you know, there will be people there that I kind of sync a bit better. Yeah. So we go off for coffees and then we make it, um, regular and, Again, those become the, your your mentors, and and like you said, you have to just mingle around people that are kind of the same path and, and journey. Be it you know going on holidays or doing groups or events or whatever it might be. Awesome, thank you. 
So what's your what's what's next? Are, are you going to be in? Uh, are you moving away from UK soon? Uh, not soon. I think in a year's time, I'll probably look to head back to Thailand. I've started up a weed farm and a comedy club out there. So that is awesome. Yeah, I know. it's gonna be good fun. It's gonna be. Uh, Did the comedy club launch? Uh, it, uh, for next month. So we're under construction right now on Khao San Road. So. You better share everything on 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 social because I'm I'm curious to see. You know I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shameless self promoter on social media. So. Awesome. Uh, are you planning to invest in anything in UK? I'd love to. So that was the main advice I got from uh, the, these people at Baby Bathwater I met is they recommended I do like join an accelerator or an incubator or mm-hmm. a VC group just to just to meet young entrepreneurs and give them advice and help them. Because that's the great thing to do when you're in this transition period. Not sure yeah. what to do is, is help others pass on some knowledge. And, and it's also fresh, right? You've, you've just exited a company, you've been through a couple of years of a ton of stuff mm. it it you know it, it's fresh in your mind so that's the best time to to share with others sure. right so last i have three questions as the uh, exit interview <laughs> whatever um number one um what is a quote that you live by hmm. a ship is safe in the harbor but that's not why ships are built that is a really good one. A ship is safe in a harbor, but that's not why ships are built. Yeah. I'm going to steal that, okay? Yeah, have it, mate. Whenever I have to motivate someone, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply that. That's that's a really good one. Right. Um, next, uh, tell me a book that in, that has had, had had an impact to your personal or professional life, whichever you prefer. Uh, Crossing the Chasm, I think, new to tech. uh, It was just the fundamental book uh, that I've read fourth time now. I think too often people try and read 100 books, uh, but Bruce Lee said he's scared of the man that's trained one punch 100,000 times rather than someone that's trained 10,000 punches once. So I think people need to nail the fundamentals and Crossing the Chasm. It's really important at that. Just talking about targeting your marketing, finding a niche, listening to your customers and making something good enough that word of mouth makes you go viral. I, th- I think if people nail those in any industry with any product, they probably can't fail. Uh, I need to read that. And, and to be honest, like repetition is is important. So I don't I like that relates to me. I've read uh, a book that I love three times as well. So it, it, it's important because it, st- it sticks better. And the last question, um, what's a good habit that you you promote? Find, find the things you love. Like motivation's really hard. Um, if 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 you've ever tried to motivate yourself to stay in a relationship that's not working, <laughs> you realize yeah. it's a, a failing venture. Um, and and likewise, you know, I see people in jobs that they describe like prison sentences. Oh, if I, if I just stick it out for two more years, that'll look good on my CV, and then I'll get a promotion. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you'll just end up in another job you hate working with people that don't inspire you. Um, you know, they're saying, if you don't want your boss's boss's job, then you've got the wrong job, right? And so, yeah, I think it really is a cliche for a reason. Find something that you're passionate about. Doesn't all have to be, not every day is joy, but if there's just enough passion and fun there um, that, that it gets you through the bad days, then you will win. Uh, it, it's very, A lot of people are chasing success and money in the short term, um, and they're really frustrated because they never quite get there and they're always competing with people. And the reason those people beat them is because they, they love what they do. Exactly. And, and they were prepared to fail and get knocked down and get back up again and try again because they just didn't want to do anything else more. Yeah, very true. And that was the same for, for me. I've, I've failed so many times because I was doing it for the for the money, for the fame. I wanted to become this. And once I ma- I learned to let go of all of that, and just be my true self and, and enjoy the activities that I do, that's when things turn completely. Yeah. So thank you so much. Mate, such a pleasure. Pleasure. Um, awesome to have you part of the founding team of Misfit Founders. You're the first, the fourth person joining. Season one. Season one, yes. <laughs> yes. I hope it goes and, places. As and, I say, I can't be the only person it resonates with. I have a feeling. That it's, it's Misfit Founders is how we all feel, I think. We are slightly broken toys. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> It's just nice to find our tribe. I will send you an invite to our uh, to our community on Slack as well. 
and um, maybe we'll do let's see if uh, once we publish this um, this episode we might do an ask me anything if you're up for it absolutely um, for people in the community to to chat with you about your experience happy to share awesome thank you thank you take care